Administration. Um, we've been talking a lot about keeping the airways clear, and um, just in my particular case, they ran all the usual tests, you know, the sleep studies and allergy testing, but I'm finding in these meetings and in rehab, we're coming across patients that have COPD that also have Sjogren's disease. I don't know how many of you have this, but in working with my doctor, they I used to have an exacerbation about once every three months, and I never could get through a day without wheezing. And they finally determined that if they could keep the mucus secretions thin, so they put me on medicine to you know thin that mucus and then keep me on something because they determined after allergy testing that I'm, there might be an outside chemical catalyst that was closing down airways. Well, once they started doing that, I'm off of prednisone. I have not had an exacerbation since they did all of that. I'm just saying there are many other things that could be affecting the way that. Yeah. About 40 years ago, <coughs> 40 years ago. 40 years ago, you quit smoking. About 40 years ago, I quit smoking. And 30 years ago, I had that with one kid. Um, those tubes are, have been damaged and aren't, instead of smoothly tapering, they're kind of lumpy, bumpy, and like a, a bumpy road that you're driving on. And just like your car is kind of bumping on that road, air, mucus is kind of bumping on there, which allows bacteria to set up housekeeping, cause some infection, causing the road to get bumpier. Like, you get ice in the winter here, it causes the, you know, little cracks in the road, now you got to crack more ice and it's become sort of a, a self-perpetuating process. And that's often what happens with bronchiectasis, that infection leads to more bronchiectasis, that bronchiectasis leads to yet more infection, so a vicious cycle that might have initially started with the whooping cough as a child. Well, what you can do for that is treat infections properly. And you did. Uh, very occasionally we do surgery to remove that part of the lung. Yeah, and the problem is usually if the, the disease is diffuse, you can't take out all the lungs. In the very rare circumstance where it's just limited to one part of the lung, it makes sense to remove that part of the lung. But that's pretty rare that we encounter that. So you have to treat infections, prevent infections, Smoking will well, smoking contributed a little bit to it. But again, it's not just one thing, it's all these things kind of adding up. And a pull up? A pull up, um, you know, that, that could have been caused by a bout of infection that caused damage to the lung and left you with this big hole, which is what a pull is. By laryngeal reflux, you mean gastroesophageal reflux? I'm not sure I know what you mean by laryngeal reflux. Do you know Picky? 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm not. I think there's a, some miscommunication. My guess is they're talking about gastroesophageal reflux irritating the larynx. Okay. And yes, if you have gastroesophageal reflux and some, if it's irritating your the vocal cords, some of that acid is getting into your lungs, which can make that. Sarcoidosis and COPD. Is it a piece of that or is it a separate Separate disease. Separate. Her question is sarcoidosis and COPD, are they related or are they the same disease or different? Bronchiectasis, you know, depending on how you like to what how you like to put things into buckets. Uh, we sometimes lump it in with COPD because if when you do breathing tests on patients with bronchiectasis, they will have the same pattern on the breathing test that we would see in patients with chronic bronchitis. But they kind of get there by a different path. <laughs>
depending on how bad your lung disease is, it might take longer to recover. But it's not like you go from hot to cold and within 30 seconds you feel better. And in fact, some patients, the, the trigger for them is not just hot or just cold, but the transition from one to the other. What if you don't even go out? And, and it's a bad day outside. No. Is it bad inside for you? Got the air That's what I've been led to believe. I mean, you're inside, got the air conditioner running, but it's 101 degrees out there. No, I, I don't think that's bad for you, except you might get a little cat and fever. And, right. I don't have any I've idea. been told that bad outside is going to be bad inside. No. I feel a difference in my house on the temperature, like last week when it was over 100. Even last night when it was only 80 instead of 90. Well, I feel it, a difference, even though I never touched my air conditioner. Right. And it may be more than just the air temperature. It may also have to do with air, with the humidity. And the air, so that, you know, if the humidity is really high out there, even though the air is cooler inside, it's going to be better than being outside. But it, the air may be more humid than if it wasn't 101 and high humidity out there. So yeah. maybe that speaks to some of your issues. Have you found, Dr. Diesel, that people who have air purifiers on their furnaces or in their on their systems in their homes uh, having some improvement? Air purification, not not of the ones in the room, not those necessarily, but the ones that are actually attached to your uh, ventilation system. You know, I don't have a good way to answer that because um, you know it's so. I don't have any experience in that. No one comes in and says. You know, doing terrible. I put this uh, device on my air conditioner. Now I'm doing that. So, uh, as opposed to, I've got a hundred patients and I put on this drug and I get a sense of about two thirds of them got better. I just don't have the numbers and the way to collect that information. So, I don't know. And that's why. Yes, sir. Can I begin to thank? Sure. We have a small, small token of appreciation. That's our official press management. Stay right. Virginia. That's our alum. 